eight weeks. That is how long it has been since I have been able to stand up in this pulpit and look out at your beautiful faces instead of the lens of an iPhone camera. I did not know eight weeks ago how long this strange way of doing worship and being the church and living in the world would persist. And still, I don't know how much longer it will be until we can bask in the warmth of a good hug and a face-to-face -face smile and a meal shared across the table from one another. A minister friend and colleague shared with me the other day that while struggling with the inability as church people to come together, that she found some solace in the words of a counselor who said to her, it has always been the primary job of the church, God's people, to do the most loving thing we can possibly do in any situation. And perhaps the most loving thing we can do right now is stay physically distant from one another. Mm. Too often, too oft repeated sayings keep running through my head these days. One is, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Have you heard that? Uh, the other is, out of sight, out of mind. On the opposite ends of the human connection stand those two statements. Separation can lead to greater closeness in heart and mind, or separation can set the stage for being forgotten. Hmm. Part, of, part of what we're going through right now is, is figuring out what we're going through right now. We are wrestling to find meaning in a time unlike any we have ever experienced before. History has shown us that finding meaning in the middle of an experience can be particularly challenging, and, and sometimes it is only later, as we, as we take a look in the rearview mirror of time, do we see more clearly, okay, okay, this is what we learned, or this is how we changed, or this is what rose to the top of importance, or, or this is what sunk to the bottom of insignificance. Yeah. When we tell the story of this time, when the history of us during COVID-19 is recounted, our best understanding is likely to come in a flashback. Do you know that term flashback? Uh, Merriam-Webster defines flashback as a device in the narrative of a motion picture or a novel by which an event or scene taking place before the present time in the narrative is inserted into the chronological structure of the work. It also can mean an involuntary recurrent memory, a psychological phenomenon in which, a, which an individual has a sudden, usually powerful re-experiencing of a past experience or elements of a past experience. And those experiences can be happy, they can be sad, they can be exciting, or any other emotion. In the movies, flashbacks are often used to fill in the blanks about, about why what is happening in the present is happening. It's a tool through which meaning is found. Our scripture story today comes to us like a movie scene or a novel flashback. For the past four Sundays, the lectionary readings have taken us to the event of Jesus' resurrection as his followers uh, experience Jesus being alive in the hours and days and weeks after that event. Today's reading takes us back to the week leading up to his death. Among the four Gospels, only John records for us this conversation between Jesus and his disciples as he talks with them about his upcoming departure. From John chapter 14, beginning at the first verse, Jesus says to them, don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. 
There's plenty of room in my father's house. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back, I'll come back and I'll get you so you can live where I live. And you already know the road I'm taking. <laughs> Thomas, the doubter, said, Master, we have no idea where you are going. How do you expect us to know the road? And Jesus said, I am the road. Also the truth. Also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Philip, Philip said, Now, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. <laughs> You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand? To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. Believe me, I am in my Father and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. The person who trusts me will will not only do what I'm doing, but that person will do even greater things than I'm doing because, because I, on my way to the Father, am giving to you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. From now on, whatever you request along the lines of who am I and what am I doing, I'll do it. That's how the Father will be seen, for, for He is in the Son. I mean it, whatever you request in that way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What we know about John's gospel is that uh, it was the last gospel to be compiled time-wise. The scholars of John's gospel tell us that it likely did not take shape until nearly 100 years after the birth of Jesus. The, the stories of Jesus had traveled through nearly 70 years of life experiences by the community of believers since his death and, and resurrection. And so it's through the long lens of time that in John's Gospel we find more and more meat has come upon the bones of what the life and death and resurrection of Jesus meant to the lives of his followers. What did it mean that Jesus, still in his early 30s, and after only three years of public ministry, departs the earth, physically separates from his followers. Have you ever wondered, um, have you ever wondered what would have been different if Jesus had not died so young? What if he continued to travel the world of his day for years among his followers, teaching and modeling the gospel way of life? What, what if Jesus had been given longevity on this earth? What if he had been physically there to, to lead his followers for 30 years instead of three years? Would his ministry have been enhanced? Would, would his message have had a greater impact? Would his influence in the world have been appreciably more? In this story and other places in the Bible, no one around him seems to understand or see what good possibly come from his leaving them. Jesus himself recognizes how disruptive and upsetting and deflating that separation would be. His opening words in this conversation echo that sentiment when he says to them, now don't let this throw you. Or in the more traditional versions, do not let your hearts be troubled. Mm -hmm. You see, Jesus knew separation had the potential to destroy what had started. He knew that one way to approach separation is out of sight, out of mind. Would they forget him? Would they forget what he came to give them and all he had taught them? And for his followers, it's clear they're shaken. 
Would they be lost in his departure? Would separation mean for them out of sight, out of mind? Would God still be with them when the face of Jesus they would no longer see? Have you ever been lost by someone? Uh, I guess I was about, about eight years old when one evening while attending a street fair in a town about 25 miles from my hometown with my parents and my sister, uh, as we were walking along, I was distracted by something, and my parents evidently had taken their eyes off of me. And so my parents and my sister walked on while I stood in place, captivated by whatever captivates an eight-year-old's attention. Now, in retrospect, I, I, I do not know for how many minutes they walked ahead and I stayed behind, but, but when I discovered that they were gone, and all I could see was a crowd of strange faces. Well, it felt like I'd been gone from them for hours. It felt like I was completely alone in the world, even though there were people all around. And I remember in my eight-year-old brain thinking, what if they never try to find me? Have you ever had an experience like that? Fred Craddock, uh, who you know is one of my favorite preachers and storytellers, relates this incident that many of us can connect to. He said, when I was a child, I played hide and seek with my brothers and sisters. You remember the game, don't you? Hide and seek. Uh, one in the group is it, which means hiding one's eyes and counting to 100 and then announcing, coming, ready or not. And now it goes in search of the others, now well hidden. The first one found is now it. Uh, he said when my sister was it, she cheated. She'd go one, two, three, four, 97, 98, 9900. Ready or not, I'm coming. He said, but I didn't care that she cheated because she, he said I was well hidden under the porch, under the steps of the porch. Behind the trees, in the barn, in the corn crib, round and round, she searched, she searched, she searched. She passed by me again and again, he said, and I was confident, oh, she's never going to find me here. And he said, but then after a while, it hit me. Hmm. She'll never find me here. And he said, so I stuck a toe out, and she saw it. And she said, you're it, you're it. And he said, I crawled out muttering, oh, fooey, you found me. He said, what did I want? To be hidden? Yes, I wanted to be hidden, but more than that, what did I really want? To be found. Jesus goes to great length in this conversation to reassure his friends and followers that separation does not mean he will forget them, or that he's pushing them away, or that their relationship will end. They will not be lost to him. It will not be out of sight, out of mind. He says to them and to us, I will always have a place for you. There will always be a place in my heart for you. Leaving and going and moving forward sometimes, yes, leads to physical distance, but it does not mean they are lost to him or he to them. He uses language like, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and later on he says, I am in you. To confirm that conviction that that bond, that bond between them is God-inspired and God-created, and it will not be loosened by changing circumstances, including the transitions of life and death. It is strong and firm. Love, love will not let us go, as the hymn writer said, and we'll sing in just a few minutes. Love, love is stronger than death, and it is certainly stronger than, that, than other lesser transitions of life, including separating ourselves during a pandemic. Love is stronger than that. Beyond reassuring them that their bond of love is strong enough to endure his leaving, Jesus also offers them in this conversation another level of meaning to his departure when he says, 
when I go, greater things than I have done, you will do. Jesus understands his own departure to mean that space is being opened up for his followers to grow in their faith. You see, with Jesus around them, with Jesus there to do the works of God for them, maybe they've hung back. Maybe they've hung back, allowing him or pushing him to make all the decisions and initiate all the acts of caring. But now he's saying to them, your time has come. I will give you all you need to continue in the way of the gospel. In words recorded in the 12th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus tells them, listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground and dead to the world, it's never anything more than just one grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and it reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, he says, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have life forever, real and eternal. Like many of you, I'm sure, I've one, been wondering, what in the world is God doing among these days. Could it be that in our being apart from one another, space is opening up for us to grow in our faith? Many of us have more unscheduled time than ever before. Many of us are being made more aware of the vulnerabilities in life that others have known for a long time. Many of us are seeing how critical are, are those connections between us and, and, and that we all have to take on greater responsibility for maintaining and nurturing those connections. Where, where once it may have been all we had to do was show up somewhere to experience being the church. Now, it's up to each one of us to reach out from our individual spaces and separate places to be the church, God's people. On this day, when we celebrate motherhood, among the many ways we see mothers sharing their love in the world is included the proverbial mother bird coaxing if not pushing her child out of the nest. Okay. Now from one vantage point, that can be seen as an act of separation, forced separation. Poor little baby bird. The nest is so comfortable. The meals are being spoon-fed morning and night. It's a great place. But from the view of the mother, she knows that her job, perhaps her most important job, her greatest act of love is to teach that baby bird and enable that baby bird and allow that baby bird to make space for that baby bird to fly. Staying forever under her wing, that baby bird will never fly. Have you ever met a bird that cannot fly? Hmm. Oh, we, we may have met birds who were so cute in their perch on their cage, but can't fly. Mm -hmm. And how sad it is for a bird not being able to fly means he can't be all that God created him to be. How do we know, how do we know we're going to make it through these times? What do they mean? Many of the things that we've often done or the places that we've often gone to reassure ourselves that everything's going to be all right, were many of those